With that, can I invite uh, Sir Richard uh, Sheriff to address us? Thank you. Well, just picking up the very eloquent discussion on the challenges of living in interesting times from John Andrew earlier, uh, I think it's appropriate that we consider and remind ourselves that looked at over the sweep of history, peace is not necessarily the default setting in international relations. Western European nations, which have enjoyed 70 years of peace, may need reminding that war is something that only happens, not something that only happens in faraway countries of which we know little, to paraphrase Chamberlain's words from 1938, but a monster with a dynamic of its own. And here, in this part of Southeast Europe, there is no need to remind us that peace is precious, fragile, needs to be worked for and paid for. And as we look at the international institutions established after World War II to prevent the recurrence of such a catastrophe, the, UK, the United Nations, NATO, and the EU, and indeed, the global, what we see is the global security environment remaining in fluid transition addressing insecurity associated with the perception of unsolvable 21st century challenges, and a global economy a decade on from the great crash still facing significant issues. The complexity of modern security problems is matched by a perceived entropy in the global security systems. The majority of our capabilities do not align with or are finding it difficult to adjust to the problems we are facing or will face. They were set up to deal with yesterday's problems. And our solutions today, our action and or inaction, can produce second or third order effects that create new security problems that eclipse the gravity of the original problem we hoped to solve. So unsurprisingly, perhaps, the challenges we face today derive from this dynamic of action, inaction, and reaction. Focusing on Southeast Europe, of the many geopolitical and security challenges this region faces, let me just highlight three. First, the long-term ethnic tensions which precipitated and are the consequences of the wars of the 1990s and which have been frozen rather than resolved by the Dayton Agreement. I experienced these firsthand as the EU operational commander for the operation in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Next, I would highlight Russia's efforts to destabilize the region. As part of its efforts to undermine the international institutions, it sees as its principal adversaries, NATO and the EU. The evidence of this, well, last week's events in Macedonia. Close at home, of course, in Montenegro, uh, we have seen the reality of that as well to prevent Montenegro's accession to NATO. And the third challenge, arises from Southeast Europe's immediate neighborhood in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East, the Syrian civil war, the refugee crisis. Well, let me expand on the challenge presented by Russia, which is NATO's principal defense challenge, so it's a liability that Montenegro will also take on when it becomes formally a member of NATO. Well, by his actions in Crimea, Ukraine, Syria, and potentially in the Balkans as well, Putin has ripped up the post-Cold War security settlement of Europe, a settlement based on working with Russia as a strategic partner. Any thoughts of partnership are now long dead, and Russia is now de facto NATO's strategic adversary. And Mr. Putin has achieved what he has because he understands the application of power and strategy and is effectively changing the strategic order possibly just not only in the Middle East, but also across Euro in Europe and along Russia's southern border. And what's really clever is the way he is effectively, as a, strong, a weak leader, a strong leader of an essentially weak state, directing his efforts against weak leaders of states that are essentially far stronger, but who lack his grasp of power and strategy. And indeed, in the words of Dmitry Trenin, who heads up the Carnegie Moscow Center, and a man with close connections to the Putin regime, the Kremlin has been at war since 2014. And I'm not talking here about conventional war, clearly, but I'm talking about that hybrid asymmetric approach which we saw deployed so effectively in the American election, the undermining the integrity of a state from within through the manipulation of minorities, clever, sophisticated propaganda, information operations, the use of special forces, and, of course, the use of cyber. And that's what Russia's activities in this region are all about. 
So now more than ever is the time to reinforce, build up, and reform organizations like NATO and the EU because they are critical to long-term peace and stability. NATO remains the linchpin of European and transatlantic security. The bottom line, of course, is that it gives us collective defense through Article 5. Common values also matter. Democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. But above all, NATO gives us the means to meet the strategic challenges of the age by pooling the efforts of 28 nations, all of whom even the strongest would be weaker, either militarily or politically, or both without the alliance. A NATO strategic concept agreed at Lisbon in 20, 2010 and ratified at subsequent summits highlights the Alliance's core tasks and principles, collective defense, crisis management, and cooperative security. As well as the deterrent posture NATO is adopting in the Baltic states and, North, and in Eastern Europe, another liability, of course, to which NATO, uh, Montenegro takes on, NATO has much to offer in Southeast Europe. First, of course, is collective defense under Article 5, as relevant in this part of the world as it is in the northeast of Europe. On top of this, the alliance casts a blanket of stability. Then there's the support the alliance could offer to nations in the front line of the refugee crisis, together with engagement with Turkey to bind that nation more closely into the community of European nations. Finally, NATO can and should do more to support the international coalition confronting the challenges of the Syrian civil war and the jihadist terrorism it has spawned. But NATO cannot do it alone. The EU is also a critical player. Witness, for example, the comprehensive normalization agreement between Serbia and Kosovo, an example of putting ancient enmities aside in the pursuit of wider and longer term European Union accession. Well, let me just wrap up by saying that in the face of the multifaceted defense and securities issues we face across Europe as a whole, and in Southeast Europe in particular, the complementary application of NATO hard power and EU soft power is critical. Thank you. <laughs>